Okay. We're double live. Awesome. Cool. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, the May uh, 2021 live stream. Um, our previous live stream was just three weeks ago because it was delayed a week, but we wanted to get back on the, um, the, the same schedule that we had previously. Um, so thank you so much for joining. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about sort of what happened in April um, and what we're planning for May uh, and other projects that are just sort of going on continuously. Um, so if you have any questions about anything that I talk about in the presentation, uh, feel free to add them to the chat. Um, and then we'll jump into questions, uh, any questions for Matt or me around the method or uh, anything else that you want to ask about. Uh, it's an open floor. And if you feel like your question would be better asked in audio form, um, just raise your hand in the questions chat and say that it's an audio question. Uh, and you can, we'll open the floor up for you so that you can just ask it directly. So with all that being said, I'm going to present my screen. Cool. Can you all see that? Great. So uh, recap of what we were doing in April. Um, so as you may have seen, Matt and Shauma filmed a whole bunch of videos together. Um, so there was one on Shauma's channel and then one on Matt's channel uh, with more of the um, the sort of like the, the hype aspect, you know, like white guy speaks perfect Japanese. Uh, but then there were also a couple with uh, more substance, one of which Matt has already released and another which is in the works around, you know, how Shauma became a, um, a creator and then, you know, how he learned uh, Chinese. Um, and so on my end, I spoke at a conference in the UK uh, and gave Refold as a lightning pitch. Um, I posted that on Twitter a few, a few days ago if you're curious and want to check it out. Um, but then also myself and two other members of the community, uh, recorded a podcast about immersion learning and our experience with it. Um, so also on the Twitter, I would, uh, recommend go checking it out if you're curious. Uh, as far as the projects that we've been working on, um, we published stages zero through two of the simplified guide. Um, we have also been working on English fluency tests. So we're trying to come up with our own standard of what is considered fluency. Um, according to our process. So uh, these four tests were um, people who were very proficient in English and just allowed us to sort of start to break down what are all the components that we look for uh, in terms of fluency. And once we have that system um, reasonably well done, at least the for V1, we'll expand it into other languages. Um, I know that French in particular, they've already started doing their own uh, fluency test and designing their own. So we wanna come up with some sort of standardization there. Um, one of the other projects was uh, we started collecting time tracking information from the community. Uh, everybody sort of has their own method of doing it. And we were hoping that we could come up with sort of like a, a single spreadsheet that everyone could use, but it turned out that that was actually not going to be possible just because everybody has different uh, needs when it comes to tracking. So um, instead, that is going to be uh, an article that's going to go up on the website. I have a draft up in the, in the, in the community already uh, just explaining what to track and why to track and, and um, how tracking affects your um, your immersion and your motivation, et cetera. Um, we have also been working with a uh, NLP researcher to figure out how to do 1K DAC generation automatically. Um, so this, for the, for the larger languages, we have enough community support where we can um, just sort of generate them by hand. But for the smaller languages, we want to be able to generate it from a corpus. Uh, and so this would allow us to quickly generate uh, 1K decks for various languages. Um, so that's been going on sort of behind the scenes. And the other big project that's going on is the V2 of the website. So um, we launched the project uh, two weeks ago. Um, we're doing massive refactoring of the code base and, and implementing new features. Um, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about, about that later and like what you should expect in the uh, next coming months. So looking at May, um, the release plans for May are to finish the simplified guide up to stage three so we can get parity with the detailed guide. 
Um, we are also working on the Spanish quick start guide and the Japanese quick start guide. Um, and so the, what we're really focused on right now is how can we make the on-ramp to immersion learning as easy and fast as possible? Because um, it's really difficult for people to sort of A, wrap their head around the idea and then B, actually get started with it. And so we sort of want to flip the order um, so people can get started with it before they've actually read the whole method. Um, and we feel that that's going to make it much easier for newcomers to uh, start the process, join the community, and then go back and read through the roadmap. So we're sort of flipping the order of things. Um, and then other ongoing projects uh, are, as I mentioned, the auto, deck, uh, auto generation uh, of 1K Dex, uh, simplified guide translations. We're launching that project this week. We have six translation teams, um, and the goal of that is to reach out to non-English speaking communities. So we have, uh, I think, Russian, German, um, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, and French, I think. I need, I need to double check that. but. Um, the website V2 project is going to be going on behind the scenes. That's going to be multiple months. We'll probably that'll be probably a six-month project, but the first release of it should be coming uh, within a month or two. Um, and then one of the other uh, sprints that we're launching or that we launched a couple weeks ago was to start collecting sentence finding workflows because we want to have examples for uh, new people who come into the community to see um, when they're starting the sentence mining process, looking at examples of good sentence mining setups and how easy it can be to sentence mine cards. So those are all ongoing projects. So talking a little bit about website V2, um, what we're looking for for new learners is uh, we want them to hit the home page, then they would hit the quick start guide, and the quick start guide would give them basically everything they need to start uh, and get ramped up with refold in 30 minutes or less. Um, so we want to have uh, specific content resources for beginners, um, uh, explaining how to access the community. We're going to be, um, I know a lot of people have complained about how the, there's this bot invite infrastructure in the Discord. Um, all of that is going to move to the website, so you can just direct access servers um, rather than going through the process of joining one server and then hopping to other ones. Um, we'll have the 1K decks for everything. Uh, there are many different communities that are currently working on 1K decks, including Korean and Chinese. So we'll be able to get those uh, up and running pretty quickly. Um, and then, as I mentioned, curated resources for beginners uh, to get their entire system set up. Um, and a little bit more of, about this, sorry. I didn't realize I had another slide. Um, <laughs> We also are going to start linking to specific grammar resources. Uh, right now, we sort of have this generic of, you know, go search out some grammar resource. But we want to be a little bit more explicit with it and say, um, from the perspective of comprehension, what are the specific grammar points for this language that you need to learn? Uh, and then linking to direct guides for each of those grammar points. So trying to streamline exactly what a learner needs to learn from a grammar perspective, um, in addition to everything else that's going on. So uh, we're working on the first two quick start guides this month, and we should be releasing them by the end of the month. Uh, and then the other big factor of the uh, website is um, Patreon is fine. It's a good first area to, or, or first method of getting users and um, having uh, support from our community. But uh, there's a lot of limitations with it. The UI is kind of funky and hard to use uh, and annoying, um, and so what we're going to be doing is just using Patreon for the payment side and the um, sort of the learner management side. But all of the content is going to be distributed through the website. Uh, and so right now, there's not a huge amount of content. It's really just the live streams and the Q&As uh, and the JP1K deck. But as we move forward, we're going to be building out uh, more paid decks in addition to some of the free ones. We'll have more paid videos and more paid articles um, and advanced guides. Uh, that are going to be more suitable for the stage four folks. So um, everything necessary to go through stage three will still be free, um, but for convenience and for uh, advanced features, we're going to put those behind the paywall and they'll be accessible through the website. Um, and that is all I got. So if you have any questions about what we did in April or what we're doing in May or you know what any of these projects are and what we're working on, feel free to ask them into the chat and we will answer them.
Cool. So on that note, um, if you are new to the live streams, you've never been on one before, uh, ask your questions in the questions channel and I will get to them. So starting from the top, uh, RS1999 asks, uh, Matt, what are your favorite video games, if any, for Japanese immersion? Are there any specific types of genres that are better than others? Yeah, well, sorry to disappoint, but I've never really been a gamer, and I've never really played video games. Uh, like, e even as a kid, I think uh, my my parents never really uh, were were fans of, of letting me and my brother uh, play, me and my brothers play video games. And I think the result of that was, for me personally, I never, just never really got into it. And for my other, one of my other brothers, he's kind of the opposite. He always wanted to do it, and the fact that I think my parents didn't allow him to do it ended up uh, turning him into like a really big gamer once he finally was kind of on his own and there was nobody to tell him that he like when he could and couldn't play video games. But anyway, yeah, besides Pokemon, that was like the one exception for me. I liked Pokemon when I was a kid and I played a little bit of Pokemon in Japanese. Uh, I haven't really played any video games in Japanese. There's been a couple times where I tried to get into video games in Japanese. Like I tried to play Dragon Quest simply because Dragon Quest is so prominent in Japanese culture that I wanted to be able to get all the references that I was constantly hearing. But I just found it super boring and couldn't get into it. Uh, I also tried to play like Persona and Final Fantasy, but I just personally, I just don't really enjoy video games, so I couldn't get into it. So I can't really speak from experience when it comes to video games, but I think it really comes down to uh, the following criteria if you want to judge, uh, not really just for video games, but how helpful is any particular immersion source going to be? First of all, there's comprehensibility, right? You, if uh, you want it to be comprehensible, but uh, not to the point where you're understanding literally everything, otherwise there's not going to be anything left to learn. Uh, and then second of all, it has to be an engaging to you. So with video games, probably less of an issue because uh, if, if you're going to go out of your way to play something not engage or to consume something not engaging, you'd probably just choose a TV show or something that's like kind of more opt like fully optimal for immersion than a video game. Uh, but the last factor, which I think is extra important in the context of video games, is density. So basically, if you for one hour work, one hour's worth of consumption, how many sentences are you coming across in your target language? If you're talking about reading a book, then you're going to be coming across tons of sentences be, or, or, you know, same thing with listening to an audiobook. It, there's pretty much no dead space, no white space. It's just constant exposure to the language. So uh, on the density category, it's going to be really great. Uh, on the other hand, for certain TV shows, there might be scenes with a lot of dialogue, whereas there's other scenes where it's action happening or just storytelling is being done through visuals and there's not a lot of dialogue. And with the video games in particular, there's a huge spectrum, right? There's certain video games where there's almost no dialogue. It's almost all just gameplay and action. And the little bit of dialogue or the little bit of language there is is just the same couple of things over and over and over. So for me, Pokemon was kind of like that. I mean, there's a decent amount of dialogue in the Pokemon games, but overall, most of the time you're, you're in battles, uh, you're, you're exploring the world, and there's not a lot of exposure to the language. So I'd say there's probably some video games, you know, maybe Skyrim or something, where it's pretty close to watching a TV show in terms of how much exposure you're getting to the language, so it's really great. And then there's other things like Call of Duty or maybe something like that where it's, it's pretty much no exposure. So I'd say that that's probably the biggest factor when it comes to judging how helpful a video game is going to be uh, for language learning. Yeah, the one recommendation that comes out of the Japanese server a lot is uh, visual novels. Um, yeah, I mean, that's are... vi visual novels uh, are much closer to a book than a video game. It, it, I wouldn't even really call it a video game because all you're doing is reading text. There's virtually mm -hmm. no gameplay. Every once in a while, you have to make a decision of uh, do you want the character to do A or B? And it's literally like a multiple choice option, normally with only two options. So it's you could call it a video game. But uh, yeah, it's very close to a novel, which is why... Uh, in, in combination with the fact that there's voice acting and you can easily look words up and things like that, it can be very optimal for learning languages. Cool. Thank you, RS1999. Um, same person has another question. Uh, are there certain mnemonics that are too easy or should be avoided? Which types give your brain the best workout but without being too easy? Mnemonics? Yeah, they said mnemonics. I'm not sure i understand that yeah i mean in general i don't really think mnemonics should play a big role when you're learning a language uh if you're you know w when we're talking about learning the very first 1000 words in the language 
some people have an easier time with that. Some people have a really hard time trying to memorize words in a language that they're that they're new to and their brain doesn't have uh, any infrastructure for. So in that case, in, uh, mnemonics might be helpful just at the very beginning when you're learning those first 1000 words, if you're the type of person who's just feeling like it's really not sticking. But after that, I feel like, you know, if you're learning one target sentences that you found in your immersion, you just shouldn't, it shouldn't be that hard to remember. And so the time and effort that it takes to create an, and remember a mnemonic is just not worth it because you can just, you know, pretty much remember it without, you know, just directly without some kind of intermediary step like that. So um, besides spe kind of ed cases like uh, the first thousand words, I don't really think mnemonics need to be used. I don't think they're helpful for the bulk of the language learning process. The other one thing I'll say is that some people, there are very fancy on uh, memorization techniques out there like memory palaces and people who compete in memory competitions like memorizing the deck of a, of a shot of memorizing the order of cards and a shuffled deck of cards or memorizing you know thousands of digits of pi they do use these uh memory techniques like um uh memory palaces and things like this so they obviously work but the problem is the way that these memory techniques work is you're taking some kind of abstract information like the meaning of a word and you're converting it into something visual that you can visualize in your mind's eye and then you're putting that, that visual object into a certain location. And so if you, in order to access the information, you have to decode that visual image back into the abstract information and that takes a mental process. So although yes, you could technically use memory techniques and like memorize a whole dictionary and there's actually people who have done this, when you're actually immersing, it's not gonna be very helpful. You're not gonna be recognizing very many of those words or understanding many of those words because they're not memorized kind of directly. They're memorized in this one step removed form of, of something of the information converted into a, a mental image, which is why I think it's not that helpful. And in fact, I think there was some Chinese guy who memorized an entire English dictionary and he wasn't, he could hardly speak English at all. So it was kind of just this ironic, perfect example of, of what I'm talking about. Well, hopefully we answered your question. Um, if you are on the call, feel free to rephrase it if we didn't. Um, but otherwise, we will move on. So uh, Bast is asking, Matt, I think you mentioned in a previous video that you had tried a polyphasic sleep schedule. I was wondering what was your experience and what was your sleep schedule? Did you decide to start polyphasic sleeping in order to spend more time with Japanese each day? Uh, how long did you do it? Why did you stop? Would you recommend it? Um, or do you think it's better to stick with the sleep schedule described in the book, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker? Yeah, so for anyone who doesn't know, polyphasic sleeping is basically when instead of just having one single block of sleep each night, you sleep in, in multiple sh shorter segments. So probably the, the most realistic one is biphasic sleeping, which is when you, you kind of wake up in the middle of the, I mean, biphasic sleeping could be any sleep schedule that involves two blocks of sleep. Uh, I don't really think you would count having a normal night's sleep and then taking a nap. I, I think that's kind of different. But apparently there were uh, tr there were in, in in humanity's past there were there were periods when we were like hunters and hunter gatherers where we would wake up you know we would go to sleep sleep for a few hours wake up in the middle of the night socialize and do other activities for a couple hours and then go back to sleep for an, another couple hours or maybe it wasn't hunter gatherers maybe it was later uh later on um when, when we, were, we were a little more advanced than that but anyway there are doc apparently i've heard there are doc there are cases documented of like large groups of people doing this consistently so uh, clearly you can make it work to a certain degree uh, there's also more intense forms of polyphasic sleeping like the one that i particularly tried was called the uberman sleep schedule which is where every four hours you take a 20 minute nap and that's it. And what this results in is two hours of sleep per two, 24 hour period. And the like theory behind the sleep, the, this sleep schedule was that uh, there's when you go to sleep for eight hours at, at night, part of that is REM sleep, which is the important part of sleep. And then there's non REM sleep, which is not important. And your brain is just kind of not doing anything that matters. And so if you take a 20 minute nap every four hours, then you, your brain goes directly into REM sleep and you end up getting two solid hours of, of REM sleep without any of the, the uh, non REM sleep, which is essentially just a waste of time when your brain's doing nothing and, and you're unconscious. So I read this on the internet and I just believed it because back uh, at this point in time, uh, when I was either like, I think this was when I was a freshman in high school. Uh, I was very gullible, not very critical. And 
I just had some sense that there must be a lot of crazy life hacks out there that normal people don't know about. So when I heard this, it just felt this fit my model of like, oh, this must be one of those crazy life hacks that's going to make me, you know, have this huge leg up over everyone else uh, that in the world, basically. And so I tried it. I tried to execute it. And I, I actually I tried multiple times on, on multiple occasions to really get it to work. But my experience was uh, basically that I would be um, have have like really huge spikes in energy levels like I would feel completely dead like a zombie for for like a couple hours and then maybe after a nap I would feel like I'd have a lot of energy and feel great but then after a little while I'd go back to feeling like a zombie and then eventually I would just kind of like pass out like I would try to I would lay down to take my 20 minute nap and I would just sleep for like 18 plus hours and not be able to wake up at all like I, I would just completely be out and then i'd wake up like 18 maybe even 24 hours later being like oh what the what the fuck happened and i'd look at the the clock and be like oh crap it's over so i never got it to work uh and a little bit later on i discovered these articles on the super memo website uh the the author of the super memo website has spent a lot of time researching sleep and he put forward a pretty detailed argument talking about how the idea of polyphasic sleep is pretty much total bs and uh it it's it's the whole idea that non-REM sleep is not important is completely false. And apparently now we know from neuroscience that even during non-REM sleep, your brain is doing really important tasks. And it's it's not healthy to to if you try to deprive yourself of that. So I, I my current belief is that polyphasic sleep is not healthy, especially long term. And you're, you're, it's probably going to lead to your, your health and especially your cognitive health uh, de uh, degrading over time. So I definitely wouldn't risk it. And yeah, I, 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 my current belief right now is that just sleeping, um, you know, seven to eight hours, maybe seven to nine hours, depending on, on your body, uh, each night in one block is probably what's going to be best for your health, your mental health, your physical health and your well-being. So that's what I try to do. And the, yeah, the reason why I tried to do it, it wasn't really specifically for, I'm um, trying to increase my exposure to Japanese because this was actually before I started age at. So I didn't really even have the idea of ex exposing myself to Japanese all the time. It was after I was interested in Japanese, I think, but, uh, yeah, it was before I really knew about immersion. So I think for me, it was just the idea that like, oh, what I could just have six more hours every single day, every single day to just do more stuff, just live more life. Uh, and that, that idea itself felt like, well, if that's possible, why not? Well, everyone should want to do it. It's kind of just like how I also, when I learned about lucid dreaming, I was like, oh, what? You could just be conscious doing your dreams and you're dreaming every night anyway. Oh, of course I would want to do that. It's like just increasing my life. And I'd still feel that way. And I mean, I still feel that way about lucid dreaming. Uh, and I would still feel that way about polyph polyphasic sleeping if I believed that it actually, um, you know the 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 promise of it was legitimate in that if you if you just adjusted to the sleep schedule you could have just as as high quality of sleep with with less time but you know uh, it, when it when it comes to trading your health and mental health um for it it doesn't seem worth it uh, oh yeah and the last detail i'll say is that when you look up on youtube people's experience with with doing uberman there's a lot of people who are like they're making update videos they have they don't have no one i couldn't find a single person when i i mean maybe now they're, they're it's different because this was like you know when i was in high school but i remember back when i was in high school i'd look for for people on youtube talking about their experience with uberman which is that that crazy sleep schedule and there were a lot of people talking about the first week of uberman the second week of, of using of doing uberman someone made it to a month but there was no one talking about having done it more than a month you know no one's like okay i've been on it for a year and that was also kind of a warning sign that uh it's probably not legit cool thanks for the question best um atenius asks could we get a little detail on the status uh of the russian version of the simplified guide i'm hoping i'll be able to show it very soon um yeah so we have i think one russian volunteer translator um and so uh, so far, all of the translation teams have been working on the detailed guide because the simplified guide wasn't released. Um, the One of the main goals of the simplified guide was to make it easier to translate. So it's about one quarter of the length of the detailed guide in terms of number of words. So uh, much easier. Um, I have chosen a translation content management tool and a translation um, collaborative management tool. Um, and so we're 
I need to set that up this weekend. And then we're launching the project on Monday. Um, and at that point, it is a open um, platform. So the, the tool that we have, uh, it's called Crowdin. Um, they were kind enough to actually give us a free license for it because uh, we're an educational institution. Um, and it's, a, it's actually the same tool that uh, Khan Academy uses to translate their site. And so anybody anywhere can create a, a translator account and can contribute to the process. Um, and you can actually see a report of how much of um, various things are translated. So we're hoping that with community support, we can get the translations done very quickly, but it's very dependent on um, whether we can find people who are comfortable in both, you know, for Russian in particular, um, finding people who are comfortable in Russian and English who can donate their time um, and can help us, you know, achieve that goal of, of translating the simplified guide. Um, but as far as which things to translate, Simplified Guide is definitely number one because we know that that's what's going to allow people who are not native English speakers to uh, come into immersion learning, join the Refold community. Um, and I think that once we have that in place, we're going to see um, a much bigger explosion in terms of the number of people that, that join our community. And I think it's also going to allow us to start doing a lot more crosstalk um, and connecting natives of different languages who are learning each other's languages. Um, to help each other with the process. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Wait, this might just be my imagination, but I feel like when you read out the question, you said quick start guide, not simplified guide. No, it's a simplified guide. Did I say quick start? I totally could have just been my imagination. I'm no idea. I might've said quick start. I, it says simplified. So oh, okay. <laughs> that's what well, I was talking about. <laughs> either way, no worries. All right, thanks for the question. Um, Cody is asking, currently learning Spanish and have a good grasp of the language so far and can understand dubbed animes perfectly. However, with natural speech, noises in the background, and now masks, comprehension in real life seems impossible. Is this something that you think is pretty normal? It seems like an impossible hurdle that I might never be able to over overcome. Haven't had time recently to really dive into all of the refold text, but was curious to hear if you either had this problem and overcame it, or if it's covered in refold. I mean, I have trouble hearing people with masks all the time in English. Like regularly, I will be at a store, especially when it's they're wearing a mask and there's like a glass or a plastic, you know, um, barrier between you and, and the employee. A lot of times they'll ask me a question. I literally am just like, I have no idea what you said. And so I, I, uh, I, I think that that's more of a, a limitation of, of like a physical limitation rather than a language ability uh, limitation. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, also, I, I definitely have experienced this in general with Japanese, where there was a period where uh, when I could hear my immersion really well. But when I went out and tried to talk to Japanese people in real life, it was like my listening ability was just like two notches worse. And I think that is because uh, if you only ever hear things through headphones, sometimes things just sound different in real life than through headphones. So I think just if you've never had any exposure to real life language, then that it, it can take a little bit for your brain to adjust. And also there's this, the quality issue, whereas like when you're wearing headphones and you can make the volume whatever feels comfortable, then uh, it's like every, it, it's, every, everything's just gonna be harder when the sound quality is worse or it's harder to hear, there's noise in the environment. So I think like one thing you can do, this is a technique I heard actually from Lamont from Days of French and Swedish, where if you have over the ear headphones, he said that sometimes when his ears would hurt, he just put the, the headphones around his neck and he'd keep listening and that would make it a lot harder to hear. But again, that would that extra challenge would help him train his listening ability up. And you can also speed up things when you're listening to it to like increase the challenge. But also more than anything, I mean, you just got to practice. Like if you're having trouble hearing people in real life with masks, maybe you just got to practice talking to people in real life with masks and, and you get better by actually doing it. So I'd say well, with the caveat that probably it's always going to be hard to hear people in real life with masks because that's what my experience is with English. Uh, I think this, you could probably definitely improve. The one thing that I would add to this is that um, anime is way easier to understand than people actually talking. Uh, like I did a binge of just watching like talking head YouTubers for a, a while. And when I went back and listened to anime, I was like, oh my God, it's so slow. There's so many dead spaces. People speak so clearly. Um, it's just so much easier to understand. Um, so for me personally, I would say uh, stop watching anime and start focusing on much more difficult content. Um, 
especially like native level difficult content people having you know talk shows um there there are tons of talk show podcasts where there's people are talking over each other and yelling at each other or telling jokes um and so there's there's plenty of harder listening material that you can use to, to train that ability yeah i think that's definitely true and uh this is actually reminding me of something i was thinking about just the other day which is i was listening to this japanese youtube video of it was actually on a youtuber's second channel where they would just upload conversations that they had with their friends like really casual conversations there's one they were both eating and they were talking while they were eating and it was actually like pretty hard to understand and that got me thinking about why and i realized that uh, first of all like yeah w everyday speech is in a way inherently harder to uh, to understand from a listening perspective than anime because anime has this like hyper articulation that makes every sound really easy to pick out and hear whereas real life speech tends to be much more blurred and slurred and and that makes it more difficult but also if you have one person talking to a camera uh, they tend to have one coherent line of thought that they express. And also, I feel like they just still articulate things more uh, than when you have two people talking. I feel like when there's two people talking, especially when when they're not really conscious of the fact that it's going to be on camera necessarily, that is when, in a way, things get the most blurry and the most uh, hard hard to pick out. And the other aspect of this is, like, if it is a talk show and there's two people talking and their job is performing in front of an audience, they're probably also going to be a little bit more... Um, they're they're going to enunciate the sounds and, and just speak a little more coherently probably than the average person who hasn't practiced speaking a lot. And so if you could somehow find videos of two people who like aren't people who don't talk for a living, having casual conversations with each other, that is like really good practice. And it can be oh, surprisingly challenging, even if they're talking about a pretty mundane thing. Yeah, <laughs> I would also recommend stand up comedy because they do not enunciate. <laughs> they speak so fast. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Cody, for the question. Um, Blue Newt is asking, Katsumoto has said it took him around 10,000 hours in 18 months to gain fluency. Do you agree with this number as an estimate for people who are hardcore immersing? Um, well, first of all, Katsumoto himself admits that that's a super rough estimate. He has really no idea. Second of all, the story that he learned Japanese within an 18th month period is also not true. He actually learned it more over the course of a, of like a little bit more than a two year period. But at the beginning of the two years, he didn't really have his method solidified yet. So what he basically did was say, OK, I'll just kind of say it was 18 months and that I was doing my final method the whole time. when in reality, it was a longer period that involved a lot of trial and error and things like that. And if you if you watch my video called um, how to use ajat.com. I have a, I, I show a bunch of screenshots of AJAT throughout the video, and one of the screenshots is a, a, a blog, basically a, a blog post that Katsumoto made on a website that was not AJAT, uh, and, and he actually made the blog post before, he, before he, he became fluent in Japanese, and that is the proof of how I know he didn't actually learn within an 18-month period, because if, if you take together, if you, if you, take together everything I show in that video, it doesn't add up. So he himself didn't actually learn Japanese in an 18 month period. Uh, he wasn't keeping track of how much time he did. So his 18 hour, his 10,000 hour thing is a super rough estimate. Plus that doesn't take into account the quality of hours, right? A lot of those hours he was literally sleeping, which in my opinion is probably negligible in terms of how much benefit you're getting. So, you know, not not every hour is the same. An hour of sleeping while you have Japanese on in the background is not the same as an hour of active immersion. So I kind of think that that the idea that Katsumoto learns Japanese in, in 18 months and 10,000 hours is kind of completely meaningless. Uh, I think that if, if you're talking about getting to basic fluency, I'd say 4,000. My, my current estimate is maybe four or 5,000 hours is probably what it uh, what it takes. But again, it's, it's, it's really hard because we're talking about how over what span of time are those hours spread out across and what are those hours consist of? Is that counting passive listening or not counting passive listening? I think it's it's uh, really hard to say. But it's really a guess because we really haven't yeah, collected yeah, it's a huge a huge Motors is a huge guess. Mine's a huge guess. We really Actually, need more. Um, have you ever taken a look at Stevie's spreadsheet to figure out his how much time he spent in those 18 months mm -mm. 
he probably has the most um, detailed time tracking that we could potentially use to, to estimate it. Yeah. Well, I, I think in, in that case, it'd be far less than 10,000 hours. Yeah, I don't I don't think it would take 10,000 hours. Um, that just seems wildly out of line with the results that uh, yeah. some people I mean, are reporting. They, they say it takes 10,000 hours to become like a professional violinist, right? Or like a world class violinist, right? So if it yeah. took that amount of time just to reach basic fluency, that would be a, a bad deal. I would I would buy <laughs> a professional violinist instead. Well, <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you, Blue Newt, for your question. Uh, Dario G is asking: Is there any difference between a twenty-year-old starting learning a new language and let's say a thirty or forty-year-old, and so on? I mean, my sense is that uh, you, you, if you could create a graph of basically your your natural talent, we, we could say, or your natural aptitude to learn a language, and then age. Uh, so your natural aptitude for, for learning language on the y-axis, and then your age on the x-axis. So, you know, when you're first born, it's extremely high. And once you, and it stays high for a while, and then once you reach probably like 10, 11 years old, it starts like dropping off very quickly and probably by the time you're like 18 it, it starts to level out and it starts to to decrease at a much slower pace and then i'd say from like 18 years old up until the time that you die whether that's like at 80 or 100 or 120 probably slowly decreases so probably a 30 year old or a 20 year old does have some advantage over a 30 year old but i don't think it's it's a huge advantage um, and that's just based on what I've seen in terms of the number of people who have started at different age ages and, and reached fluency. Like there's lots of people who have started learning Japanese or Chinese at age 20 and reached a near native level. But I only know like one or two that started when they were 30. And there's a lot of factors that go into that. I mean, that probably has more to do with the fact that people who are in their 30s are already really well established in their life. So it's unlikely that they're going to go take off and live in a foreign country and like dedicate their whole life to uh, mastering a foreign language so that's that that aspect of it is, is probably plays a bigger role but my intuition just from everything i've seen is that yeah there's the younger you are you do have some advantage but it, but it's not that much of an advantage it's not, it's not huge uh assuming you're already kind of like over the age of, of 18 realistically like 5, 14 15 16 you're you're already on a pretty even playing field with everyone else older than you at that point um but again, I'll say that I don't have any real good stats for that. Uh, and, I, and I think even the studies that are out there, you can't really tr like when you, when you look up the most like when you Google about age, the relationship between age and fluency, statistics will come up. But those are based on like case studies where they interviewed people like, OK, you've learned this language. When did you start? OK, let's test how good you are. But most of those people used really bad methods, right? They weren't doing immersion. They weren't really keeping track of like they'd measure how long the person was in the country or how much time had passed since they started learning the language. But they didn't really measure how many hours they actually spent with the language or what they were doing for those hours. So I don't really think you can trust any of those studies that are already out there. But I also think that uh, in order to really know, we would need studies that were more reliable. So hopefully in the future with Refold, when people are tracking their immersion in a consistent way, and we can measure their results in a, in a consistent way, we can actually see maybe like, oh, yeah, according to our data, people who are you know 20 have like a five percent advantage over people that the average person that is 30 or something like that uh so that would be interesting to know one day but my personal opinion is no matter what you shouldn't let your age be a reason for you to, to not learn a language you shouldn't develop limiting beliefs of like oh i'm gonna be bad at it because i'm old or whatever uh, because there are people like steve kaufman who have started learning languages like in their 60s or 70s and and reached high levels and steve kaufman says that his he is better at learning languages now than he was when he was 16 because so much of learning a language is the technique, right? You're a built, you're knowing what to do, knowing how to handle things. And that's just going to get better and better and better. So I could totally see it being possible that, you know, when I'm 30, I'll be a better language learner than I was when I was 20. In fact, I, I hope that will be the case. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a, a graph that's, that's spread around, um, language learning sites a lot around language ability um, linked to age, and it, it shows like a super big drop off. But if you actually look at the data on that one, it's definitely um, correlation and not causation. They're essentially just saying like, um, 
people there are way fewer people who learned languages when they're older so therefore like there's a correlation between age and not being able to learn a language but that doesn't resonate with uh, me that doesn't make sense to me so all right um katie w is asking i also read why we sleep recently it talks about how important sleep is for among lots of other things memory formation and pattern recognition but both incredibly important for language learning do you think you could make sleep work for you more efficiently in any way e.g immersion immediately before sleep after sleep Anki before or after sleep, naps, have you experimented? Question is directed at either of us. Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say, I think it was in the last live stream where uh, someone asked about how to improve sleep quality or how to get, I think actually the question was, how can I get up in the morning easier? And Ethan talked about this idea of setting it up. Uh, well, I think he's just said that he will set an alarm 30 minutes before he actually wants to get up and he will just turn on the light in his room and then go back to sleep and that helps him get up and but what he used to have and what would be ideal is some setup where the light automatically starts fading on 30 minutes before you want to wake up and i bought a kind of smart plug that allows me to do this and it has made a huge difference it's way easier to wake up than it's ever been and i wish i knew about this a long time ago so i if you have any trouble waking up in the morning or having this consistent sleep schedule i highly recommend getting one of these smart plugs it's only like less than 30 bucks on amazon but uh, yeah, if you if you look on the Super Memo website, the guy who wrote Super Memo, like P uh, Piotr Wozniak, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name because he's Polish. Uh, he's done, a, like I said, a lot of research into sleep and also a lot of research into memory because he's actually the inventor of the SRS. He created the most sophisticated space repetition algorithm uh, so far in existence. And he, he probably knows more about human memory than anyone else on the planet, in my opinion. And he says actually that it's best to do learning immediately after waking up like when you wake like during sleep your brain is, is kind of like reorganizing itself cleaning up uh all the, the debris that piled up throughout the day consolidating memories and so when you wake up in the morning that's the f i mean of course there's like a, a kind of maybe a half hour to hour long period where you're kind of like still in the process of waking up and so you're foggy but once you're fully waking up uh, once you fully uh woken up your brain is pretty much in the best state it's going to be for learning the entire day. Uh, it's going to be the most receptive. It, it's the most open and empty. And then throughout the day, you, you create new memories and you fill it up more and more and more until the end of the day when you're, you're tired and exhausted and your brain's filled with, with memories that were created during the day. So he said that uh, the, the idea that if you want to memorize things, you should do it right before sleep is actually a myth. And actually memorizing things like doing Anki reps or doing SRS study uh, is best to do in the morning. So I think that could probably apply, probably would apply to all of immersion. So I imagine that an hour of immersing bef like in the morning before you start work is probably better than an hour at the end of the day after you finish working. So I know people like Luke Truman uh, have uh, like to use the technique of just waking up an hour early and committing to a full hour of language learning before the work day and building that in as a habit. I think that's a good idea. Uh, but of course, not everyone's going to have the luxury of, of doing that. So, you know, don't stress over it too much. But uh, that's kind of how I view the, view the question. Um, on my end, I'm a huge fan of naps. I think naps are great. Um, and I like my ideal sleep schedule that sort of optimizes for, you know, most amount of time awake and uh, least amount of tiredness is uh, six and a half hours of sleep in the evening like overnight and then a 20 minute nap during the day or maybe two 20 minute naps during the day um and i find that after just like a quick nap i'm much more refreshed um and when i when i first started studying spanish i had basically no endurance whatsoever for it and i basically had to take a nap every two hours because my brain would just shut off uh, and i couldn't process any information i started to get headaches um uh, but a quick 20 minute nap and I feel completely refreshed, ready to start going again. Um, and that works for language learning, but it also works for work. Um, so I've, I am a huge fan of naps uh, and I think it, it can, you can really, it, it is much more powerful to take a 20 minute nap and then go back to doing the thing that's difficult than it is to try and force yourself to stay awake when your, your brain is just shutting down. Yeah, I totally agree with that as well. And also, uh, Wozniak, the guy who I was just talking about, also was a fan of naps. So, naps are good. 
Cool. Thanks for the question, Katie. Uh, Steve is asking. Um, Steve is in his 40s. Uh, doesn't feel like raw ability has gone down. Main trade off is young people have way more command over their time. But I do think the kind of people who do this sort of task, hardcore language learning, will select for people who optimize learning over time. But there's no way that time flexibility is any huge benefit. This makes me think uh, when I am Steve Kaufman age, semi retired, my ability will go up. So, not a question, but just uh, adding to uh, Dario G's uh, question before. Um, so, there is an example for you, Dario, <laughs> of uh, somebody who is you know, taking on the challenge of language learning uh, in his 40s. So. Um, Next question. I don't actually know how to pronounce this, but the Maxed I don't know. <laughs> um, so the question is, who is the youngest person you know that succeeded with refold slash MIA? I feel like there was somebody in the community I knew who he was like 16 and he had already reached like basic fluency in Japanese. Um, so I guess he probably started when he was like 14, around there, or something like that. It's probably the youngest person that I have heard of. It's kind of hard, because if you go any younger than that, then they might have, you know, kind of just picked it up naturally um, due to immersion. Like, like I actually, okay, I should say, when I was in high school, there was, there was a girl that I knew who pretty much reached basic fluency in Japanese just from watching Japanese, just from watching anime with English subtitles. But she had started when she was in elementary school. And so, uh, and also, back then, I sucked at Japanese, so... I can't really say how good she actually was. I just remember that she was having, she seemed to be very effortlessly having full on conversations with the Japanese kids at school. And she seemed totally fluent from my perspective. But of course, in reality, she um, she might not have been as good as I remember. So I guess you, you could say that maybe she uh, is kind of an example of refold methods because she got good through immersion in uh, when she was like elementary school age. But uh, yeah, I don't know if that really counts. Yeah, I'd also uh, mention Frozen Rosen, um, who's pretty prominent in several of the communities, but I think mostly the Mandarin community right now. Um, and he is a native German speaker um, and learned English almost exclusively through YouTube, starting at around age 14. Um, and he spoke English like in a conversation for the first time at 17 uh, and was fluent. Um, and he actually he came to the States and did a, a six-month um, immersion or like exchange uh he said he was already fluent by the time he had his first conversation so i would say that's a pretty solid example um of someone quite young using immersion methods uh and using a silent period um i don't think he did it deliberately i think he was just like interested in stuff on youtube and it happened to work for him so um i yeah but i would count that towards a good example Cool. So that is the end of the questions that we have currently. Um, we started a bit late. So if anybody wants to ask any additional questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to them. Um, but if nobody submits a question in the next few minutes, then we can definitely just call this one early. Uh, Brett wants to ask a voice question. So go ahead, Brett. All right. Hopefully my mic's working this time. We good? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So I was curious. Um, I had basically recently uh, a lot of IRL stuff come up, and I had to stop immersing for like five months. But I kept up on my Anki reps, and I feel like this has created kind of a weird situation where I have a much larger chunk of known words that keep triggering in my immersion that aren't acquired, so it requires me to stop and look them up. I feel like it's quite often. So I was curious, in a situation like that, do you think it's better to still keep trickling in new cards and just kind of let it work out by getting more immersion? Or do you think it's good to stop with the new cards and focus on trying to acquire more of my current known words? I mean, I would probably say I would still continue making some cards, but I would probably reduce the new card creation to be like 50% or, or or even lower than, than what it was before and allocate that extra time to immersion to kind of solidify everything to kind of like get everything back in, into balance especially if you feel like what like what you're saying where 
you're, you're coming across all these words that, that you know because you've learned, but you have to kind of think about it for a second because you haven't acquired it yet, or maybe you have to look it up real quick to refresh the memory, then you know that kind of tells me that you have all of this latent, latent knowledge, or I guess, I mean, it's not latent, it's just normal knowledge that therefore is like latent potential to be acquired. And so you probably want to like immerse as much as you can to acquire all those things. And therefore it'd be a good idea to kind of cut down on Anki. But for me, I always like having at least some amount of Anki in my routine just kind of like keeps my whole language learning process uh, more kind of like energized and fun. So if you if you don't feel like that's the case, you could go all Anki for a while or all immersion for a while. No, Anki, I think that'd be totally fine. But if you're like me, I would at, at least do like, you know, a couple cards a day just uh, to keep the habit and things like that. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Well, if there are no other questions, uh, then I think we can end this one here. Thank you so much for everybody who joined. We really appreciate it. We always love to see you. Um, love to talk to you all. So uh, thank you for all your great questions. Hope you learned something. Hope you got something out of this. Um, and on that note, we'll see you again in four weeks. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks so much, guys.